Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Rams Brothers the Pod. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined by the other host of this show, Nick. And Nick, uh, this is your week, man. It's the Lions and the Rams. How are you? Are you ready to go? Uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, at the end of the day, I want a Rams victory. If the Rams were to lose another game this season and I had to pick oh, one, this would, this would be the game I would pick for them to lose. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. it. That's what you're going to say. You're going to make us all sick in the morning. It's too much. It's Thursday. We're not um, ready for, for you to project a loss. That's how you I'm not projecting a loss. I'm just saying if they could lose this week, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. That's oh, it all. would be. Oh, it would be the worst thing in the world. No, Absolutely. don't don't overreact. Uh, it's they, the regular not, season. Not overreacting. It would be very, very similar to the Jets loss last year it, where it's gut-wrenching and you know the team is not built to go deep into the playoffs. That's what happens when you lose to an 0-6 Lions team at home. Uh, it should never happen. This is uh, yeah, one of the best. Uh, it has Jared's to be. lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has to be one of the best soap operas throughout the entire NFL season. Just this game in its own. The Rams are going to be hosting an 0 6 Lions team, but it's not just any old, ordinary 0 6 Detroit Lions team. For starters, it's a coming home party for the four former members of the Los Angeles Rams who left in the offseason Jared Goff, Michael Brockers, Aubrey Pleasant, and Brad Holmes. It's also the first time the quarterbacks Matthew Stafford and Jared Goff will be facing off against their former teams. What will the interaction between Goff and McVay <coughs> be like, Nick? Will Dan Campbell do something irrational and bench the starting quarterback at halftime? No. How will the crowd react to Jared Goff's return? How badly will the Rams beat the Lions? Are the Rams an absolute lock to cover the spread? The amount of built-up storylines within this game is why football is the best soap opera in America – Yes, over The Bachelor. Yes, over Jersey Shore, whatever you want to call it. Um, Those are reality TV shows. Those are not soap operas. All right, well, give me a, a D- Days of Our Lives. Days of Our Lives. Uh, uh, General Hospital. But this game is better than all of those soap operas. Um, and why is it such a good soap opera, Nick? For starters, uh, enter one of the most compelling characters in Detroit in some time. Uh, looking back at some of their coaches over the last 20 years, You'd have to marry Steve Mariucci's energy with Jim Schwartz's brain and Matt Patricia's appetite to get Dan Campbell. Let's play the video, Nick, of him throwing his quarterback under the bus <sighs> after getting ripped apart by the Bengals last weekend. You ready for this? Um, I don't feel that way yet. Now, I will say this. Um I feel like he needs to step up more than he has. And I think he I think he needs to help us, you know, just like everybody else. And uh, I think he, he's got to he's going to need to put a little bit of weight on his shoulders here. And it's time to step up, and make some throws and do some things. I'll let you react first. The long pause like he doesn't want to say it, but then feels like he has to say it. Um, yeah. I mean, they're just a horrible team from, like, top special teams, offense, defense. They don't do really anything well. They've fought to be in this game, like, in these games that they are in. Um, And then they lose in a dramatic fashion, or they get blown out by the Bengals, who are a really good competitor. Um, Jarrett did not look good in that game, Mm -hmm. that Bengals game. So I I don't know if I really blame the guy or not, because he's a first-year head coach, and I think the city has already fallen in love with Dan Campbell. So I don't know how. I because he's passionate. Yeah. Like, like it's like that video that, that that came out where um some guy was bashing Goff and he's like, This isn't Detroit football. And it's yeah. like so like Detroit football is all about what? Machismo and just like acting like you're good. Well, yeah. Like yeah. D- Detroit football has been the laughing stock of the league for like since I've been born. Right. And the same with same with me. I, I don't necessarily have a problem 
with what he said. When you're a head coach in that situation, you're a new head coach, your back's against the wall. I'm only going to compare it to Nick Sirianni because, uh, as I mentioned in previous podcasts, we're tuned into the local radio station. But you some are of tuned are, in. You are tuned in to the local Philly radio stations. I do not listen to that. Garbage. Right, right, right. Well, regardless, I just heard Nick Sirianni talk about Jalen Hurts. Some of his inefficiencies. Um, trying to get out of the pocket uh, when the offense breaks down, you know, the kind of quarterback that he becomes, you know, it's just a situation where when you're a first year head coach, you're going to say some of those things just to kind of get your back off of the wall or to give yourself, you know, some kind of separation between the fact that you brought in a quarterback for a rental versus they brought you in for the next five to 10 years as a head coach. So you need some separation there. And I feel like that's what these new guys are always going to kind of come in the league and do. Now, what, what he's, what he said about Jared Goff, you know, having to put weight on his shoulders, easy to say when you're Drax of Guardians of the Galaxy. That guy's huge. has the biggest shoulders in the entire world. Jared Goff is not a big guy, and I, I don't know if he has the ability to carry a team on his shoulders that has, you know, next to no weapons and personnel, and they're not built from the inside out the way that they should be. And it's obviously a full rebuild in Detroit right now as it's been. Um, and they've been putting a Band-Aid over it with a quarterback like Matthew Stafford. So, yeah, it's a, a you know, I feel like it's a headache for Detroit fans. And, you know, I, I feel bad for that situation that they're currently in. But, Nick, I mean, this is a team that's coming into Los Angeles now. And are they prepared to play the Rams? Like, I don't know. Is this a question? Are the Rams prepared to, to play them? Right. There are, there are questions that. You know, when you look at all the drama, all the storylines, you're hosting a team. You know, is, are you still ready to be prepared? Are you still ready to play the game? So that would be a question that uh, that I would just ask McVay as a reporter. But I don't know, Nick, what are your thoughts just coming off of Dan Campbell and, and the Jared Goff situation? Um, I think Detroit loves Stafford because he would, like, keep them in games. but And he would win a couple. Um, but that's just a recipe for sustained mediocrity, right? At least with Goff, you're 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 zero and six. Like you're you're gonna get a good draft pick. You'll probably get the first. Um, and like I'm not saying that's like a compliment to him. It's a horrible thing. Uh, but like at least you know you know that you can officially like push forward. Uh, if I'm a Lions fan though, I would I don't know if I would want Dan Campbell to be my like rebuild guy. No, you know Definitely. like I don't know if I trust him like you know picking the right players and you know, being that, that like beacon that like McVay was, um, that like uh, McVay couldn't handle himself better. And Campbell, he's a goofy guy, you know, right. like, right. it's just, uh, you can be that way, but you got to also like, you know, win. And, yeah. He uh, runs, he, he, he runs hot, right. As we yeah. talked about on the yeah. last podcast, he's, he's and, yeah. Four espressos too deep. I um, think, uh, go ahead. I think some team, next year is going to uh, pick up Jarrett um, in some kind of way. Cause I think he's, I think it's like already over with him in Detroit. I, yeah. Maybe like a, like a Pittsburgh or like a Washington football team or something. Yeah, Denver. Yeah. Denver. Um, just because I like, there are so many places that if they just had a capable guy, like you can't give Goff nothing. He needs, he needs more. Yeah. Than that. Yeah. Um, oh, of course. But and well, it's just, uh, it's just, and I'm sure we'll talk about. It. I'm sure you have it as as a point in in this episode. But we, you know, McVeigh's like, oh, I kind of feel bad about what I did to to him. So yeah, it's, well, <laughs> that's just a little. Uh, it's like it's like dumping your ex girlfriend and then setting her up with the worst guy ever, and then <laughs> seeing seeing them in a dom domestic relationship and being like, oh, is that my fault? Yeah. Well, no, it's not. It's the way of the world. Uh, it's it's the cost of doing business. Um, on the other side of the equation, Nick, it's a good transition that you just made. Uh, is Sean McVay, right? The guy that Wait, wait speaking, of, speaking of transitions, um, the best brewery in Anaheim. Oh, go ahead. It's, 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 it's got to be brew reacts. Before they we got IPAs, it. hard seltzers, uh, you name it. If uh, they got it, slap and tickle, amazing. Over 30 beers and 10 hard seltzers, curbside pickup, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., open every day, 11 a.m. to midnight. Uh, awesome brewery. Uh, and now, continue on with your transition thank you the the ad read was looking me right dead in the face and i skipped right over it thank Sorry, you we got it in there we squeezed it in. We, we squeezed it in uh, on the other side of the equation i mentioned lives sean mcveigh um he's a guy who flew to cabo with his fiance and the whitworths magically ran into the staffords and then pulled off a trade while kyle shanahan was drinking mojitos with his wife 
And then he rode off into the sunset. Then you fast forward to right now, Nick, he was quoted saying that he regrets how Jared Goff, uh, how the Jared Goff from Matthew Stafford trade was handled. Here, I'll go ahead and play the video. Who I think that the way that it unfolded was totally different than anybody anticipated. Yes. Could I have handled it better in terms of, hey, if there's a possibility of it, let's get ahead, even if you're out of town, yada, yada, yada. So to answer your question, Gary, yes, I wish that there was better, clear communication. You don't want to catch guys off guard. It came together a lot faster than anybody anticipated. Um, but, yeah, of course, I, I think that, you you know, anytime the tough decisions and things like that where people are affected, you always want to be as understanding, as empathetic as possible. Think about it through the other person's lens. And there's certainly things that, uh, you know, I know I, I, I would do it a little bit differently um, if I, uh, you know, when those situations arise in the future. But I think Jared knows the respect that I have for him. I feel very good about the dialogue that we were able to have, uh, you know, before he had gone to Detroit. He knows the appreciation that we as an organization that I have as a coach for all the good things that he did here. But to say that it was perfectly handled on my end, I, I wouldn't be totally accurate in that. Do I think that? So, yeah. So I'll, t I'll take this one. So to me, uh, McVeigh, <laughs> before you jump in, will always be living in some sort of regret until he wins a Super Bowl. Right. I feel like he's if he's not upset about the Goff and Stafford trade, how that was handled, he's going to be upset with the slow start or being penalized early or something else that we just don't know about yet. Um, so he is that kind of mindset where he's constantly kind of taking inventory of of himself. Right. What's the current situation at hand? He's now in a really ideal situation. So it's really easy for him to kind of sit there and just reflect on what happened in that moment and just say, yeah, well, I could have probably handled it differently. Right. I was drinking a little bit. You know, I was throwing ideas out there, throwing feelers out there. The Whitworths and Jared Goff are really close friends. You know, is there going to be some kind of offense that happens throughout that process? Am I going to hurt the guy Goff? You know, all these things um, that you just take from a personal level when you're handling a trade. Um, I, but it happened so fast. Right. On the other side, it happened so quick. Would it have happened if Sean McVay didn't jump on the opportunity so quickly and act the way that he did? So I'm sure part of him has regret. And then the other side of him is probably thinking to himself, well, if I didn't do it then, if I wasn't drinking then, if I wasn't with my fiance and the Whitworths, then the trade might not have happened. So I don't know. What are your thoughts? Um, I don't know if you have the video. Do you have the video of the, uh, the Detroit reporter asking Goff what he felt about it? No, I don't. No. Well, I'll just fill everybody in. Um, he said, yeah, like it takes uh, – takes a big man to admit that I have nothing but respect for the people over there. Just, you know, class act Jarrett, you know, just. Well, yeah. And you're kind of setting up for, you know, him coming home, right. Coming back to, to the stadium and Brockers and Brad Holmes and um, Aubrey Pleasant, right. They're, they're setting up for that reunion. I, I think you kind of have to clear the air, right. Which, which was strange though. What I saw yesterday was the fact that Stafford and, uh, McVeigh declined to talk to Detroit reporters. Did you see that too on Twitter? I'm not sure exactly who that came from, um, but apparently there were Detroit beat writers that were looking to reach out to Stafford and McVeigh just to talk about the trade or talk about the relationship between Goff and, and McVeigh and Stafford. And they both declined. Um, so that, I don't know, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, I feel like if I'm a Detroit fan and I see that, I'm just like, well, I mean, we're an own six team. Like we're yeah, probably like you can't give us the time of day. Just what do you, yeah, that it just hurts, right? So, I don't know. Any other th anything else, Nick? You want to add with the McVeigh Goff comment? Um, it almost sounds like in the beginning, he's not even talking about uh, Jarrett. It, I just kind of wish it was a little less uh, politician. Yeah, you I know. know, like That's how like he is. Dan Campbell uh, will. I'm like somewhere somewhere in. In between the two, because Campbell will be as raw and emotional as possible, and then McVeigh will be as like emotionless and uh, you know smiling through uh, gritted teeth as possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah I, think, yeah, I don't know. Like the whole dichotomy between them, and to know what we know now, and go back and think about last year, it's uh, it creates so much different tension. And like you know, it's not like they were a bad team last year. I think they could have won that Green Bay game, mm -hmm. uh, really close the whole time. So, yeah, it's tough. It's just uh, 
the whole thing. Uh, have they upgraded? Yeah. Uh, do I think they would be in this position right now with Jarrett no. still as their quarterback? No. Key, don't don't say yes. Do I think they would they would have the same record? No. Yeah. No, they would be four and two. Um, I think they would have lost the Seattle game. With um, really point, after uh, yeah, Stafford throws an end zone interception. Yeah, then you think God? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. With with great tension, you mentioned comes great innovation. So I think they were in a situation. I couldn't imagine the tension between Goff and McVeigh throughout the last you know handful of years, knowing what we know now. Right, knowing that he's frustrated with a 38 point performance from his offense on the road, creating the tension between himself, got upset. I'm sure, I'm sure he's upset well, about well, it, right? Well, yeah, he's got to act upset to the media. I'm, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he genuinely was. I, I, I believe that. But I'm sure know. he you they know, destroyed throughout... the Giants. Well, I, I know, but throughout the trade, right? I'm sure there were plenty of other staff members that had a voice throughout the process, right? Including potentially Brad Holmes, who was one of the guys that contributed to the decision to trade up and draft Jared Goff first overall. But it led to the great innovation that is Matthew Stafford. So you can kind of go both ways with it. I feel like the icing on the cake though, for us fans is when you can finally see the tape, right? When you, I don't know if there's a, for whatever reason, I feel like there's like an eight week buffer from when the tape comes out and when fans can actually like digest it and understand what's happening, unless you're Sosa, right? Sosa can get it same day and understand exactly what the hell's happening in the clip. Um, but just seeing that throw from Stafford that he made from Henderson down the left sideline compared directly to the throw that Goff made in the regular season versus San Francisco is haunting. I don't, you're, I, you can't disagree with this. It's one of those things you see it and you're like, oh, it's egregious. I wish it didn't happen, but it is the way that it is. Here, I'll play the clip. Four-man Giants rush. Stafford looking sideline. It's the running back, Henderson. I'll tell you what, it's quick. I'll play it one more time. Four-man Giants rush. Stafford looking sideline. It's the running back, Henderson. So what I saw from Stafford, no, just, real quick in that clip, real quick. Before no, let me go it. this time, damn it. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. I just, um, you know, he made that throw to Todd Gurley 10 times out of 10 in 2018, 2017. Um, it's just a little, uh, it's weird to see the regression of somebody um, just continue to, to go down, especially at, at the point of their career where it's supposed to go up. And yeah, no, like you can't blame McVay for, do, for, for wanting to upgrade the most important position. That yep. should be just bare bones. You should be it. happy as a fan that that's what the head coach wanted to do. I mean, I am happy as a fan. We're eight. We're uh, we're eight and one. Ooh, hopefully soon. Take it easy. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy with the record. I I I, I really like this team. Uh, they don't they don't do everything perfect. Um, it doesn't feel like the um like the kind of tenacity of a Super Bowl team, in my opinion, yet. Um. But I do really like what I'm seeing. Yeah, uh, it just uh, it's hard because you have that landmark of 2018 with those with McVeigh, and you're like, all right, well, you got to at least hit this now, considering you made this big move to right. somebody right. that that you think is better than the person that you were there with. So, yeah, well, I mean, the landmark, the league changes, the landmark changes, but I agree, you got to get back to the Super Bowl. But I feel like just even just watching that clip back, seeing Stafford identify Henderson. So he's looking left, right? You're looking left. You identify Henderson. You move your eyes to the middle of the field. You evaluate what's going on there. He moves his eyes, pulls his head back to the other side of the field, makes the adjustment, makes a perfect throw to Henderson. It's the the best possible clip that you can see from a quarterback, just in the motion in his shoulders, moving his head as quickly as possible back to Henderson after he progresses and reads the defense in the middle, middle of the field. It's just something that I was innately impressed with. So I got to a point last year, Nick, and, and you know this, fans of the show know this, where I just flat out couldn't lie to myself anymore, right? I wanted to see Jared Goff succeed. I wanted to see him win a Super Bowl as badly as anybody else did. Um, but I wanted to see somebody else, a quarterback. I wanted to see something else from the quarterback position under Sean McVay after about midway through the season last year, um, even to the point where I wanted to see John Wolford. And you were so mad when I wanted to see that. But I mean, it's when you want to see a change, you're desperate to see it in any in any regard. Right. Um, 
So that's just kind of one of the things that I, I've always been Can't looking at. John is. Wolford. Yeah, I know what that, I, but it's irrelevant. He's a backup quarterback to this point. I'm just saying I wanted yeah. to see something fresh. I wanted to see something new from the quarterback position under Sean McVay, and we finally got it. So it's very enlightening for me as a fan. I feel like I've been awoken and um, I could finally like enjoy football again. So I don't know. Well, like you uh, sitting back in your chair, you disagree all the way. I've been enjoying football. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it when we weren't a good team, too. I know that's maybe a controversial opinion, but uh, it's better when you're winning. I'll tell you that. Um, better when you're winning. Just uh, when you get too invested in, like, actual humans and you forget that it's just not it, – it's not just like a game on television. You know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, all that stuff isn't really important. At the end of the day – we don't know them. They don't know us. We're here to enjoy the organization. And we've been able to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And when fans are able to put together that video, that video is courtesy of Wes at Sleason80 on Twitter. Um, I think those kind of things are, like I said, awakening, right? And it's, um, you, you see winning football happening in real time. So it's it's just exciting to see. I think the biggest difference, Nick, just outside of pure talent and what is now becoming full command of the offense uh, between Matthew Stafford and Jared Goff is their yards per attempt, uh, their intended air yards and third down efficiency and long yard situations. This is something Cam called out in his recent article. It's complete. It's a completely different script with these two. Like when you hold their passing charts up side by side, it's like putting Russell Westbrook's next to Steph Curry, right? Somebody who can score on the inside. He can't shoot from deep. And then you go to Steph Curry and everything's from deep, right? It's just a much more, um, I, I would say engaging passing chart, right? Something that, that you could see the upgrade that was needed, the yards per attempt, yards per completion has all been upgraded with Matthew Stafford and you could actually see it in these next gen charts. So that would be the comparison that I make. Um, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Is there any, any other uh, passing charts that you would compare to Steph Curry or, or Russell Westbrook? I think you could compare Jared Goff's to Drew Brees in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, and I think a 27 year old quarterback has to be taking more risks and not just, you know, checking it down right? Um, or throwing it out. Yeah. So, and I don't know if he's going to like, who needs to tell him that, or if he's told it all the time and he's just trepidatious with it. I don't know. Um, I just, it's it's almost like the same thing with Ben Simmons, kind of not really though, because Jarrett's like actually out there playing and trying. But it's like yeah. if you could get somebody just to get in his head, like like a different way. Like I think McVeigh was just like mm -hmm. always like yelling at him and like screaming at him, and maybe he just needs like a nurture loving you know kind of coach. And I don't know who that is in the NFL, uh, but. I don't know. Some you got to try something else. Dan Campbell seems like the the dad head coach that will nurture you at times, but when you like don't need to be nurtured, or when you need to be nurtured, rather he'll just scream at you, right? Yeah. Just irrationally. Um, so yeah, that's. I mean, it's uh, on third and ten or longer. Matthew Stafford's ten to twelve for two hundred eighty-one yards. Rams are not good on um, third down this year. Well, a third ten, third and ten and longer. Matthew Stafford is very good. Third and um, ten, but like just traditional third downs. I think they're ranked like second lowest or something. It's well, something really. It's like a shocking number. Right. I, I think just kind of for this situation, right? Comparing the fact that Stafford has nine first downs and third and longer, right? So just you know, showing intended air yards and uh, yards per completion. Goff is in the same situation. Is eight of twelve for seventy-five yards and two first downs. Stafford's nine first downs on third and ten are <laughs> are equal. To Jared Goff's total from last season. Uh, like I mentioned, these stats are courtesy of Cam Silva and Pro, Pro Football Reference. Um, so they're telling. Uh, again, I, one of the things, everything in the NFL is twofold, right? I think there is, when you say, you know, Jared Goff is digressing or he's not in a good situation, right? There's, there's multiple dimensions to that. And I think when you look at Jared Goff's situation, of course, his completion percentage is going to be kind of around where it's been, right? 66.8 is on the better half 
of where it's been in his career. But the problem is he's not taking any deep shots, like we mentioned. And he doesn't necessarily have the talent to, A, take the top off, and, B, have those guys create yards after the catch. He's been sacked 15 times so far this season. So he's on pace to shatter his record of being sacked 33 times in 2018, your favorite team with the Rams. Um, he's currently at 9.4 yards per completion while Stafford's sitting at 13. He also leads the league in fumbles lost with four. And he's added four interceptions to that as well. So his current quarterback break is seven touchdowns, eight turnovers. But you look at his talent at wide receiver. You got uh, Geronimo Allen. Geronimo! Um, 13 snaps so far this season. Am I driving you nuts yet, Nick? He hasn't gotten a ton of work. Uh, Cardell Hodge. Current grade, 66.8 via PFF, 109 snaps registered. He's been uh, blocking well in the run game. Outside of that, he's not a massive contributor. Uh, Trinity Benson, uh, Khalif Raymond, Tyrell Williams, Tom Kennedy, right? These are guys that you didn't know before this season started. Uh, Khalif Raymond's actually having a pretty decent season. He's the leading receiver in snaps and leading receiver in total yards. Uh, Quintez Cyphus also has a total grade of 71.7. He's the leader in yards per reception and touchdowns with two. And then Amon Ross St. Brown, current grade 64.6. He's a leader in receptions and targets. And then, Nick, you get to TJ Hawkins, Hawkinson. He's a leader, uh, leading receiver with 44 targets, 311 yards and two touchdowns. And then DeAndre Swift, he's their second uh, leading receiver as a running back with uh, 42 targets, 295 yards and two touchdowns. So that's kind of the whole slate of what Jared Goff is currently dealing with. None of these players, Pro Bowl caliber, all pro level. Uh, TJ Hawkinson is obviously a decent option at tight end. That's been his security blanket. Uh, but the MO with his offense has been dink and dunk, find the tight end, find the running back in space, and try to get a play out of them. So uh, what are your thoughts after kind of looking at that depth chart? Uh, I would My initial reaction was just aggravation. Yeah, yeah. Um... Stafford would get, uh, you know, would get hate when he wouldn't play well in Detroit too. Uh, he just, they don't ask for much there. They really don't. It's just like a couple big, nice wins. And the universe has kind of made them uh, lose a couple really close games this year, which mm -hmm. would have been, because uh, they feel more like a two-win team than like no wins. Um, so, you know, I mean, the defense is also pretty shaky just in general. Uh, you know, they held fields, Lamar and Kirk cousins to like subpar days, every single one of them, three of them combined for two touchdowns and three interceptions. Obviously they all won. Uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, the whole team, it's nobody's really good enough. It's just, no. it's sad, no. uh, to see it. And I don't really like talking about it. Um, well, yeah, I, I think on the other side, too, we, we both wanted the Lions to be a decent team this year. Yeah, you kind of sneakily will text me when the Lions are, like, up. You're like, oh, Jared's going to well, do yeah. it. Yeah, I'll see you. I'll see. Well, I mean, that Ravens game, they should have very easily won. Justin Tucker doesn't hit the longest field goal of all time in NFL history. They win that game as time expires. They've lost two games this year as time expires. So it's not even like Goff has, has a chance with the ball in his hands to win the game. Like he's already had the game won, and then just unique, defeating, depressing losses in Detroit week after week. And I don't, I just don't know how they how they do it over there. Um, but again, uh, you you have a situation with with Goff. Um, the defense has been shaky, but he hasn't. I, I would agree with Dan Campbell hasn't necessarily been holding his end of the bargain. But again, it's twofold. He doesn't have the personnel to help him. Um, their defense, too, and you look at weeks, weeks one, uh, Jimmy G torched them for 314 yards. Aaron Rodgers torched them with four touchdowns. And then Joe Burrow's game last weekend. Um, I think Stafford kind of falls in that category with those three guys versus Lamar, Justin Fields, and Kirk Cousins. Um, so I think, obviously, Stafford's going to have a good day. He's going to want to have a, a revenge game against that defense. I'm sure he knows a ton of coaches, a ton of people on that sideline. Um, so I, I – I, going to predict the Rams to cover the spread, right? Especially what we saw last weekend. Um, so I don't know. You've been probably watching more Lions games than I have. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the defense or what you've seen. Uh, I don't like it. I don't like anything I've seen. <laughs> uh, they're just not good. The whole team, yeah. top to bottom. They're not a good team. They're not well run. Um, 
a lot of penalties, just like bad things that'll kind of really hurt you in the end. And they just, uh, you know, they get really, uh, they really sad. They are sad. They're just a sad, sad organization. And they always have been. And it's just a shame because like growing up, the Bengals, the Browns, uh, charge, not really chargers, but all these teams were just like horrible, like so bad. And now you look at them and the Bengals and the Browns are really turning things around. Mm -hmm. The lions are not. No. And that's just, uh, that's just how it is. Yeah, it certainly is. So what do you think we transition to Nick's picks or do we want to break into, uh, the little extra special video edit that you made for the fans? Yeah, no, we can break into it. Um, if you're not watching, uh, I think the first voice you hear, I don't know what video you're, you're going to show. I'm going to play the prison one first. So the first voice you hear is Jarrett, and the second voice you hear is supposed to be McVay. And I put their heads on this video because uh, I've just been watching some Arrested Development, and the relationship between Buster and George Sr. is very similar, I think, to the relationship of <laughs> Goff and McVay. <laughs> we, this will be tweeted after the podcast as well, but uh, we'll, we'll play it live on the pod. Here we go. And make sure you're aware that your ban on organized sports in this family has been violated. A ban on organized sports? You know, they wouldn't let me sign up for anything when I was a kid. Is that what you've been thinking all these years? No, no. You were, you were just a turd out there. You know, you couldn't kick and you couldn't run, you know. You're just a, a turd. <laughs> <laughs> it's great because, like, the the next line in, in that clip, too, I didn't think it fit the context, but it's, it's hilarious. Buster just goes, uh, prison has destroyed the way that you talk. <laughs> great show. Uh, yeah, the dynamic. Um, I'm certainly starting to see it in that first video. And I think there's a second video you have prepared as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can play it. And, right. it's, you know, same, same voices, same so, voices, same you know, concept. This one, this is uh this is Goff and McVeigh right before the Green Bay game. Okay. No, no, let me help you with that. So, oh. Hey, enjoy yourself tonight <laughs> because you are out of here. I'm not going to spend my retirement watching you wipe your nose on your sleeve. I can't breathe that. Neither can I. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it's you know what it is that that gets me that I think is really funny about it is McVeigh's face because it's like he's kind of like smiling like he's it's like an evil smile and Goff's kind of like looking up in the air like clueless. It's really you really did a great job of um, getting the um, encapsulating their uh, dynamic. Yeah, 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 and just yeah, just the overall um, like expressions and emotion from those two I think was was well done. So good job by you. Thanks. Credit to you. Production value, way up. Way, way up. All right. Next picks. Oh, are we doing this? I think we're doing this. All Um, right, everybody. Welcome back to Nick's Picks. Uh, Last week, I said it was a mortgage week. We won one bet of six. But that's okay. That's okay. We're going to come back this week. We're going to come in hot. Um, I really like uh, the plays that we have before we get started. As always. Dean, let's uh, let's hear your lock. Uh, my lock of the week is the Rams to cover the spread. Mm, Rams minus 15 and a half. Yep. Rams minus 15 and a half. Maybe even buy it up to 16 and a half because they're going to win by at least 17 points. So yeah. do whatever you got to do. Kind of feels that way, doesn't it? That's my lock. Yep. All right. So that's not in my plays. Let's just start. Uh, luckily, we're recording on a Thursday morning, uh, which means I can bet on the Thursday night game, which is nice because I, I like those games. I'm taking uh, Denver at Cleveland. I'm going to do Browns minus two. Who doesn't want to root for a Case Keenum uh, Browns team? Like Case <laughs> Keenum has been on the Vikings, the Rams, the Washington football team, the Broncos. The dude's been a ping pong ball that everybody can seem to root for because he's probably played for your team. Just like Jared Goff's Lions, they are horribly lovable, um, this Case Keenum Brown team without Chubb and Hunt. Uh, you, you can convince yourself they're going to win every week, and they always let you down. But – like they sing in cabaret, maybe this time I'll be happy. Maybe this time I'll be free. You ever <laughs> see cabaret? I never have. It's a really good musical. Um, um, okay. The Browns are a well-coached team who I think will continue to play strong games. Uh, we can't comment on the Cardinals game. The Cardinals beat everybody. 
Um, I love the underdog story to put on the Browns because they're they've been underdogs my entire life, and now it's fun. It's hard to find them as underdogs. Um, they're minus one forty uh, if you want to take the money line, but I like minus two because who loses? Or you know you're gonna win by three or or seven or somewhere in between that. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, twenty seven seventeen Browns. Um, I think they win nicely. I think Case Keenum uh, doesn't have to do much to uh, to have a good game. I think their their backup running back is going to come in tough, and their wide receiving core is going to be able to uh, dink and dunk their way to a victory. I feel like that game is tricky because what Denver's lost three straight. Yeah, but the only teams Denver have beat have been the Giants, the Jets, and the Jags. So I don't really think any of those wins really count. True. And I think a lot of people want to like Denver because it's Denver and it's like they're like a, they've always been like a historically cool organization with Elway and then um, Peyton. But it's like you have not been able to do anything quarterback wise. Um, I lied bet the Raiders last week when they were up seven nothing against Denver and they were underdogs. It was seven nothing wow. and Raiders were underdogs. And I was like, this makes no sense. That's so I'd hammer that. Um and they end up winning handsomely with with an interim head coach. So I I like this play a lot. We're moving on though. Uh, speaking of laughing stock franchises, Cincinnati at Baltimore. I'm taking Bengals plus six and a half. Uh, I am in on the Bengals. I think they're a, a playoff team, wild card. But I think they are. And I think Joe Burrow is a lot like a young Trey Young, and I will not be elaborating on that. Oh, I kind of want you to. And I will not. Okay. Wait, wait for the line to move to minus seven because I think it will. Because I think the whole world is going to be on Baltimore minus six and a half. I can't it's Baltimore. Believe it's, they, I can't believe it's that high. Yeah, I mean Baltimore. They just destroyed the Chargers, but they're not perfect. Uh, they tend to start sloppy and rely heavily on the new Superman. I love Lamar. Kid's great. Reminds me a lot of Luka Doncic. Luka Doncic. Uh, but I'll take Trey Young's Bengals, keeping it close. 31 to 30 Ravens juxt Justin Tucker victory, but the Bengals are still scrappy and they cover for us. I'm trying to get the Trey Young analogy. Like, is it something with uh he's he's on the Hawks? The colors of the teams are you something probably super easy that I'm, I will not be elaborating. Right, maybe Indianapolis at San Francisco. Niners minus four. Off a bye. We don't want to admit it. Uh, we really don't want to admit this one. But we low key love Shanahan off a of bye. Uh, the guy's a smart cookie who schemes well enough uh, to stay in games with good teams and beat bad ones. And straight up, the Colts are bad. Uh, they don't really do anything well. Uh, they have a horrible starting quarterback, and their coach hasn't produced anything outside of a quote unquote solid defense that hasn't been solid enough to stop anyone this year outside of the Texans. Uh, while McVay wasn't able to work with his goofy quarterback, Shanahan is kind of stuck with his sort of. Um, I believe Jimmy G's Niners will be uh, would have beaten the Cards two weeks ago. And it's a shame that, that they had to start a young uh, a young rookie. But I I like the number four. I feel like it's low. Um, I'm going to do 21 16 Niners win and cover. Okay, I don't know about that one. I uh, you bash Carson Wentz a little bit. He's been bouncing back a little bit. He's had a foot injury, uh, two ankle injuries. He hangs in there. I think that that game will be good. But I. Niners minus four, I think it's a comfortable line. They're due for a bounce back, like you said, off the bye. I like it. Then we got uh, Saints at Seahawks, and this is just too good of a value bet for me not to take. It's like plus 194. Seahawks money line. Uh, they're scrappy. They hung around all night with the Steelers on Monday night. They're not going to embarrass themselves twice in prime time. And I, I, I'm mainly doing it for this because I just foresee these memes. Geno Smith is going to get a win before Jared Goff does, and it's going to it's going to hurt my soul. Um, while I love certain individual players on the Saints, I don't think they figured out what their team is yet. Um, and the game is at Seattle. The place is going to be going nuts. They're fighting for their freaking life right now. Yeah, to make to make some kind of playoff push. So I think Seattle's going to win. Thirty eight twenty eight. I think it's going to be an absolute shootout. Uh, somehow, in spectacular Monday night fashion, we're going to take the underdog, and the underdog has been doing really well on Monday night. So okay, I'll take the uh, I'll take the other side of that. I'll flip the scores, and I'll take the Saints. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I don't think Geno Smith is capable of putting up that many points, but I don't know. They're interviewing Cam Newton, right? They want to bring him in potentially. 
Um, I think Seattle's fan base is beaten down and battered. Finally, if I think they were going to do that. They should have done it by now. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right. Um, but again, I think, think Seattle's a little kind of down and out at this point. My my morale as a, as a Seahawks fan this year would be down with Russ being out. But um, yeah, I mean, you never know. They're scrappy. That's for sure. Yeah. And then my quick pick, I'm going to take Falcons to beat Miami in Miami. Um, All right. I'm hearing trade rumors about Tua going to the football team and Deshaun potentially on Miami. And it's like a three-way trade. So, Yes, we'll it's not looking good for the Dolphins in their yeah. top pick. No, I mean, after losing to the Jags, I think it's going to be hard for them to beat a team with a lot of weapons. Um, the Jags don't really have that many. so I would agree. Let's run it back. We got uh, Browns minus two, Bengals plus six and a half, Niners minus four, Seahawks money line, Falcons money line. So it's not a mortgage week. I so would, you- yeah, no, I would say no. I don't put no. any mortgages on any of these bets. The one I like most, I think it's I think it's the Thursday night Browns minus two. Yeah, I think it's I think it's maybe the, I go a little Thursday Rams night. cover Browns cover parlay. I don't know. Rams, Browns, Rams, I, like, or Rams, Browns, Niners, maybe. I could see the Lions making some like late push in, yeah. in that game and like blowing the cover, but like still losing by like. Well, seven. I think it would be fun. It would be fun to take the cover in that game so that you have some kind of vetted interest like later on in the game, right? If the Rams are up, you know, 28 to seven at halftime and the game kind of starts to unravel a little bit, you have another storyline to kind of follow. So I think throwing the money on the cover would be fun. Just for the sake of we're going to be at the game. Fun for you and I. I would I would throw a hundred on it. With yeah, yeah. We got to keep the ladies interested too. Yeah, you know. So I don't know. I'm hoping it's a hard fought game, and we're going to be taking the trip to get there. Um, so I'm I'm sure it's going to be a hell of a time. But yeah, again, we'll be there. Um, purple lot, pink lot, tailgate. We're going to be rolling up in our um, in our robes, according to you. Um, we're gonna pregame the pregame. It's gonna be a hell of a time. So we're pre-game looking forward to tailgate with a little uh, brunch. Yeah, a little brunch. Got to mix in a little eggs, Benny. I've been mm. big on the big on the eggs, Benny. I recently. love eggs, Benedict. They're so yeah. Good. With a little country ham. Mm. I can only really do it with the ham. I don't like to mix in the salmon or the crab or avocado. No, or I don't think. Uh, I don't like fish at breakfast unless unless and this is good, like a lock sandwich. Oh, love that. Love a little lox and cream cheese. That's the Northeast in you. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, boys, girls, Ramley. Ramley. Uh, we will be back um, probably by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. It'll, traveling's good. Coming back from travel and catching up with work is going to be a little bit tricky, but um, we'll be back. So Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, uh, we'll have content in between. We're going to tweet out those live videos. Um, Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't want to call my own shot here, but I think they have a chance of, uh, of blowing up. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just, uh, they're they're both hysterical. Yeah. I think that, I think that's the, I think that's a really good, like celebrity, like fictional relationship that you can tie between those two. Goff as Buster has been in my head for quite some time. And (laughs) he's just such a turd out there. Sometimes I just, you know, you love him, but he's just such a turd. And I, I think it's, uh, I think it's funny. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the reaction from the fans. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Um, you know, hit us up on uh, social media if you want to uh, have a beer with us or throw the football around at the tailgate or something. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, go Rams. Thumbs Hell yeah, up, baby. Hell yeah, go Rams. Good stuff, Nick. Vamos Rams. <laughs> Talk to you guys soon. Play the face-off rock verse. It's about drive. It's about power. We stay hungry. We devour. I still can't get it out of my head. Take what's ours.